So reading wise, the month of April did not go very well. And I guess we're gonna be talking about it today. <laughs> April was both one of my worst reading months ever in terms of the star ratings that I gave. We have a lot of low star ratings for April, not very many high stars. And also the amount that I read was the, it's my worst reading month of the year so far. However, that's not as bad as it sounds because apparently in 2023, consistency is key as there's only 150 page difference between my best month of the year so far and my worst month. So I'm not taking that like to heart or anything, but the star ratings, man, I had three two star ratings in April. April and it was really really getting me down. So I did participate in two readathons in April and everything was a success as far as they go. I passed all of the classes that I needed to as well as a couple of extra ones for Magical Readathon and in my opinion I racked up a decent amount of points for Enya. So if you want to know about my readathon progress in more detail I did talk about that a little bit more at the end of the last vlog that I did because I weekly vlogged for both of those readathons throughout the month of April. But getting into my thoughts on the books and all of the juicy wrap-up good Goodness, we will be kicking off of course with the statistics and in the month of April I read a total of eight books which added up to 3,443 pages and broke down to an average of 115 pages per day. For the star ratings we had three two star reads, three three star reads and two five stars so we started and ended the month on a high. Everything in the middle was either trash or average <laughs> but this broke down to an average of 3.1 stars per book. For the demographics I read one young adult book, one new adult and six adult. For the formats we had three standardly formatted novels, two e-arcs, one audiobook, one ebook, and one manga. For the genres we had five fantasy, two fantasy romance and one romance so I pretty much stick to what I usually read in April. And lastly for the places where I source these books from, three of the books I read I've hauled in 2023. Two of them were from my own TBR that existed prior to the start of 2023. Two of them I got from NetGalley and one of them I read on Kindle Unlimited. So kicking off straight into those reviews, like I said, we start on a high, we end on a high, and we are gonna be talking about my first five-star read of the month, which is of course, Love Theoretically by Ali Hazelwood. Now, as we were getting through the month and things were getting a bit rough rating wise, I did start to think that maybe I was the problem because while I have loved both The Love Hypothesis and Love on the Brain by Ali Hazelwood, and I did still love Love Theoretically, I ended up giving it five stars in the end, it did take me a little while to get into so on reflection this is where I started to think that potentially I was the problem this month not what I was reading but I, I actually I still haven't come to a conclusion about that yet I guess we'll see but this one is about a girl called Elsie who is I'm pretty sure she is a physicist I'm not a science girly but she has been adjunct teaching professoring she's an adjunct prof professor which I don't think we have that in the UK but we might and I might just not know about it but that doesn't pay very well and so she is applying for a tenured position at MIT and because the job that she does doesn't make very much money she also moonlights as a fake girlfriend and she finds out that the person like one of the key people who is interviewing her and trialing her for this job is the brother of one of her favorite clients so this causes some problems because he obviously like she's created a fake persona for herself while she's a fake girlfriend obviously to separate it from her real life so he thinks that she's something like a school librarian or like a children's librarian and is like she's not supposed to to be a physicist. So this is your typical Ali Hazelwood enemies or like hate to love goodness where we have two people who are at odds for whatever reason. In this instance it's because this guy actually wrote a very demeaning article like way back in the past about theoretical physicists and so she's trying to reconcile what she believes about this guy based on this article that she wrote with the guy in front of her who doesn't seem all that bad but also the fact that like he believes that she's in a relationship with his young brother as well. So we have hate to love in that regard. It very much is the same kind of relationship dynamic as in Ali Hazelwood's previous books. I will say that Love on the Brain and the Love Hypothesis are kind of beat for beat the same story wise when it comes to things like the plot devices and the story beats where Love theoretically did stray away from that slightly. So while you do very much have the same character dynamics as you're familiar with with Ali Hazelwood, the story goes in a little bit of a different direction which honestly was refreshing because while I do love Ali Hazelwood and I love these stories that she delivers again and again and again. We need a little change from time to time, you know. So the reason why it took me a while to get into was because it contained a lot of like kind of jar, not necessarily jargon, but it was a lot of discussion at the beginning about science or like academic 
positions in science and also like how women are treated in STEM and that kind of thing which is always present in Ali Hazelwood's books but it did feel like it was a lot at the beginning of this one and while it is interesting and I love that background in her novels as somebody who isn't a science girly has never really been a science girly it's a lot for my brain to handle so um I did I did see in the acknowledgements though that Ali Hazelwood is aware that the beginning of this contains more of that than is in her previous novels so I do feel like it's kind of a valid not necessarily a criticism but observation on my part and for why I didn't I wasn't like so into it at the beginning. It's not my favourite of Ali Hazelwood's I have to say and actually thinking about it now looking back on it at the beginning of the month it's not the most memorable of her books. I definitely think that Love Hypothesis is still my favourite but I really liked, I mean it's hard for me to say anything about it because like I don't want to spoil it because it's not out yet, it's only out in June but also I've read it before by the same author, you know what I mean? So it's nothing too different from her previous works. That being said though I did love it and I gave it five stars. The second book that I read in April was not a five star, it was actually a two star and that one is The Faithless by C.L. Clark. So this one was another e-arc and the reason why I read this is because I was a co-host of the MB Book Club for the month of March where we were reading The Faithless, the sequel to The Unbroken. The storyline of this is it's an adult fantasy following predominantly a soldier called Terrain who was taken as a child from the country that she was born in and taken to the conquering country's army as part of this like experimental program that they did to rehabilitate all like civilized citizens or children specifically from these countries and she was raised in the army and she fully believes in the Baladaran ethos. She believes that Baladaran are not conquering or colonizing countries, that they are actually like civilizing them and bringing good things to these countries. But her loyalties are called into question when as a adult and as a soldier in the army, she is stationed at the country that she was actually taken from and told to assist in quashing a rebellion where the citizens of this country are trying to rise up and overthrow Baladaran and like reclaim the country. The other perspective that we have in here is the princess of Baladair, Luca, whose uncle currently has control of the throne. He is the regent and she is trying to prove to him that she is fit for the job of ruler, like she's fit to be queen. And she is wanting to do this by quashing the rebellion once and for all and proving to her uncle that she has what it takes to be the queen. So due to a set of circumstances, Turin actually ends up working for Luca as a go-between between Baladair and the rebels because obviously like she is from this country so Luca thinks that the rebels will trust her a little bit more as Luca is trying to quash this rebellion peacefully. I gave the first book in this series three stars it was okay and the same things like my same thoughts and feelings about the unbroken also apply to the faithless which is why it does end up being a two star because I expected more progression especially in terms of the characters and their motivations and their decision making skills that I just don't feel like we got in the faithless. Now I don't know if I'm going to continue with with this series because I feel like if this series turns out a certain way which I feel like it still might then in hindsight I may appreciate the books a little bit more but at the same time I enjoyed this so little that I don't know whether I do want to commit to that. I'm assuming it's going to be a trilogy and that the next book will be the last one. I really like the plot in here. I love a military fantasy. I love like a rebel uprising kind of plot and I love characters that are torn between multiple different things and that the way that that like really can affect the the decision making but my issue with this book or this series in general is that the characters the majority of the things they do they make based on their relationships with other characters and like I just said I love that dynamic I love that as a driving motivation but I don't feel like C.L. Clarke's writing is the kind of writing that builds an emotional relationship between the reader and the characters or the reader and the story so while the characters are making these decisions based on their relationships like I don't feel it because I don't feel the relationships I don't believe in the relationships so I'm not feeling the level of angst and like indecision that the characters are feeling which really just I can't get behind any of their decisions. There's also a sapphic relationship in here which is what I particularly would like to know the outcome of when we get to the end of the third book if I do choose to read it because at the moment I don't believe it. I don't really like one of the characters in this relationship. I don't like Luca. I think that she has first world problems when like her problems are problems okay but when you compare them to other characters I feel like she has very first world problems and I feel like 
like the way that some of these characters are ride or die for each other. I feel like they have very little like foundation to be making such like impactful decisions about their life based on their feelings that I as a reader I just don't feel like are coming across very well. So yeah sadly this was two stars from me. I do feel like C.L. Clark is a really cool person like I've watched a couple of interviews so I would be interested in reading more from C.L. Clark in the future. I just think that the issue with me in this series is not necessarily C.L. Clark's writing, it's that C.L. Clark has chosen to make all of the characters' decisions based on their emotions when C.L. Clark doesn't have a very emotive writing style. I then read, I actually got into some physical books now, I then read another two-star book which I was really sad about and this one was especially disappointing because I thought that it was going to be four. It's essentially split into sections, I think there's four sections in total. The first section, four-star potential, the second section, completely lost me so by the time we got around to the fourth section where I was more interested again it was just done like I, I, I was over it and there was no kind of like reigniting my interest in this one but that was The Unspoken Name by A.K. Lockwood which I have almost rubbed <laughs> the um foiling off the cover with my greasy greasy hands but this one is an adult fantasy following a girl called Sorway who is destined to be sacrificed to the goddess of the unspoken name so every I think it's 14 years a child is taken to the mountain which is the like sanctuary of this god and they are killed but when it's always time to be sacrificed a wizard turns up and says like okay do you want to sacrifice yourself do you want to give yourself to this god or do you want to come with me and she chooses to go with this wizard who becomes her mentor now the wizard has a goal in mind as he has been exiled from his homeland by somebody who used to be his student and is now his sworn enemy and with Soway's help he's aiming to overthrow this person and once again become the rightful ruler of his homeland now I loved that plot because something that I really felt through here that I'm still not this isn't a spoiler this is speculation I want to say based on my feelings at the beginning of this book because I just felt like this guy had so many red flags he was very much reminding me of an emotionally manipulative parent and I was really interested in the dynamic between him and Sawe and how that was going to play out because she felt so indebted to him because if it wasn't for him she would have ended her life and sacrificed herself to this god so she has gained so many years of her life because of this man but this man is continuously asking her to give more of herself to his cause and not follow what the, the the causes that she wants to. So I loved that dynamic. We also had a lot in here about like ancient gods. There was a slight sci-fi twist where you can move between worlds and like worlds where gods had died were like decaying and being reabsorbed into like the maze of the world which is essentially like the material that worlds are made out of. And I loved all of that side of this which was really the foundation on what the story came back to at the end but in the middle it was just about Sawe trying to save a girl and that bit just completely lost me I just was not invested I was so much more invested in the the relationship that Sawe had with her mentor and while Sawe pursuing this girl does feed into that it just that that storyline just didn't grip me the way the the whole lore of the world and the gods and all of that stuff really did I think that if you like the Chorus of Dragon series by Jen Lyons. I think you will really really like this book because in terms of the characters and the way they behave, in terms of the writing style, the pacing, the plot line that we have of all of these gods and like worshippers and all of that kind of stuff is very very similar to the Chorus of Dragons series. You could have told me that this was the third book in that series and I absolutely would have believed you. So if you like that series, which I actually really liked the first book, didn't like the second book very much and I've yet to continue with the third. But yeah if it wasn't, if it had continued in the vein of that first section and we would have focused on that a little bit more and less on where the story goes in the second section, I feel like this could have been a four star read but sadly it ended up being a two. Next up things got slightly better when we moved into the three stars. The first of which was the Golden Enclaves by Naomi Novig and let's be real this was always going to be a three star read for me if you've been on this channel for a while if you watch me read through this series y'all could have predicted this being a three star but this is the final book in the Scholomance trilogy which is following a girl called Elle in a world where magical children are being hunted by monsters so they're sent to magic schools that are kind of built into the void to protect them from that but these schools are also dangerous because the energy that is I guess created by all of these magical children being gathered together draw 
draws the monsters to them. Now these schools do have a lot of wards to draw the monsters out but there is a malfunction in the graduation hall of this particular school. So to get out of the school you either have to join an enclave or form an alliance because you are fighting for your life to get out of this school at graduation and when you go in you stay there for four years and you only leave when you graduate. There's no getting out of this school for like holidays or anything like that. So our main character Elle is in her final year of school and she's not doing very well when it comes to forming an alliance or joining an enclave because she doesn't have the prestige or the skill necessary to be invited to an enclave which are like prestigious magical societies and she's also very standoffish so she's not really making much progress towards making an alliance and to top it all off she's getting very very irritated because the school hero Orion Lake keeps saving her life and she doesn't think that she needs his help and she very much does not want to feel indebted to him. So this is a very mixed bag series for me which is why it gets like a flat three star rating with every book because I despise the writing style in this series. It's very much conversational which is fine. It's not a writing style that I, I hate or even inherently dislike but it does go off on tangents and has a lot like endless exposition very similar to like Tolkien in the Lord of the Rings series where Elle will be I don't know just working on a potion and she'll go dive into like the origin of a particular ingredient and this explanation will go on for three pages to the point where you kind of forget what she was doing before she went off on this tangent and I just really really don't like it I actually cannot stand it but I adore Elle as a character. I really love Orion as well and some of the supporting characters we have in here but Elle just has my entire heart. I relate to her so much and her behaviour and kind of the way she is but also the reason why she behaves the way she does. I also really love the setting of this even though I feel like Naomi Novik could have done so much more with it and I also do enjoy the plot so it's kind of like five star for Elle and the plot, uh, one star for the writing. <laughs> And that's how I get my rating on this one. This one was not any different to the others in the series. To me, it was very much kind of like the same style. I was surprised though that this turned into a little bit of a world tour when that wasn't what I expected the plot to be. So I think in terms of the three, this one is actually my least favourite, but I'm glad that I finished the series. So after my first four books in the month, after having, starting really well with a five star and then having two twos and then a three, I wanted a book that I was guaranteed to enjoy. So you can imagine my disappointment when I ended up giving it like a generous, three stars because it was a five star prediction for me and that is her soul for revenge by harley larue this is the second book and i think it's called the souls trilogy which is a series of paranormal ish like horror ish romances very smutty romances that actually have like a really cool plot which is why I really love the first one and gave it five stars. So book one is about this girl called Ray. Every book follows a different couple but we start the series with Ray and Leon and Ray is moving back to the town that her family are from and the atmosphere is just on point. It was reminding me so much of paranormal romance that I loved when I was a teenager that I wouldn't read now like Twilight, Hush Hush, that kind of thing and I loved that it kind of put me back into that place of reading books that I guess I've very comforted and nostalgic to me because of how much I loved them when I was like 18. But anyway, Ray is moving back to this town where there is a prestigious family that are sacrificing people to the god that slumbers under the town. Ray also has a YouTube channel where she conducts paranormal investigations and she decides after, she's annoyed that people keep using gimmicks to get views because she takes it very seriously, but she decides to play into these gimmicks and she finds a grimoire with a demon summoning ritual and she accidentally actually summons a demon called Leon who wants this grimoire so that he can earn his freedom. So Ray agrees to get it for him only to find that it's been stolen and together they hunt down the grimoire and also try and stop this prestigious family from sacrificing people so that the god under the town doesn't wake. So every book does follow a different couple and book two is following Juniper and Zane. Zane is friends with Leon and Juniper is somebody who the Hadley family tried to sacrifice to the god under the town and failed. So she essentially signs her soul over to Zane for his help getting revenge on the Hadley family. Now there is like a flaw in in both of like the series as a whole I guess and that is that they all kind of run side by side. So when you're reading the first book you will notice like gaps and stuff or you'll see the aftermath of something but the main characters haven't had any part in what happened to get this result so you know that the other characters are working on that but you only see that when you read their book. So I feel like that's kind of anticlimactic because you know how the series is going to end because you know what the final conflicts are, you just don't see them actually happening. So that kind of is, it's not a deal breaker for me, but I don't love that. 
I guess. This series is very, very smutty. If you go into the Goodreads pages, Harley LaRue is very good for writing a full list of trigger warnings and also kink lists for all of her books, which you, I would recommend definitely checking out before you go into these because they are intense. They do deal with BDSM. The first one dealt with things like domination, submission, consensual non-consent. And the second one I thought was a little bit more intense and dealed with things like piercing and knife play and pain and all of that kind of stuff. And I feel like that really contributed to why I didn't enjoy this one as much because it's just not my thing. I do think as well that the first book was a little bit more of a slow burn which I prefer whereas the second book gets into the smut a lot quicker so I wasn't feeling the se I love sexual tension more than I like anything else in romance and I wasn't feeling as much of that in the second book because we did get into the smut a little bit quicker. I gave this three stars essentially it was going to be a two star read. I did really like I guess the last 50 to 100 pages where we got into the plot again because I still one of my favorite things about this series is that while we have the romances and while we have some really intense smut we also have in my opinion a decent plot to balance that out as well so yeah sadly this wasn't a hit with me and I was it was my biggest disappointment of the month I'm really sad about it but I do really like Harley LaRue one in her soul to take and also I've read I think is it it's not the losers um the dare which is the novella that's like a prequel I think to the losers and I loved both of those so Harley LaRue is still an author that I do really enjoy but her soul for revenge was sadly just not it for me then we dip back down to a two star <laughs> which is sad because this book was three stars for so long and then right at the end it I'm sorry it had to drop a star but that is The Longing of Lone Wolves by Lana Perherchik. This one is the first book in a series that is a fantasy romance, a paranormal romance, a sci-fi and also like post-apocalyptic as well. So the thing that I actually really loved about this series was the concept. It was just the romance that I didn't love. So this is the Fae Guardian series and I think it's going to be 12 books in total broken down into four trilogies. So the first three books follow wolves, the second three books follow vampires, then elves and then I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure actually, maybe I lied, uh, maybe it's just going to be nine books. But anyway it's broken down into trilogies and each trilogy follows like a different type of Fae. They're all Fae as well which I don't like it when, because this is essentially a werewolf romance but they're under the guise of Fae. So like all of the creatures are fae but then they're just different types of fae. That's not the kind of fae romance that I like to read. I like high fantasy fae okay and I, I have also noticed I while I do like a little bit of contemporary fantasy or other fantasy romance, high fantasy romance is my comfort zone. That's where I'm more guaranteed to enjoy books. Paranormal, dystopian, urban fantasy, not really my thing. If I enjoy it it does tend to be the exception but the concept of this was actually really interesting. It's following a young woman who who wakes up in this futuristic world that feels historical and like high fantasy and she's surrounded like she wakes up in a world of fate. The last thing she remembers is being in like post-apocalyptic Vegas where like there's been nuclear war and society is trying to like stabilize amongst that and then she's suddenly just in this futuristic world that also feels like very very archaic. So she ends up being saved by this fae who was cursed many many years ago because of a crime he committed and he binds her into a bargain of obedience to be his voice so that he can talk to his estranged son because he is nearing the final days of his curse where he's going to die. So I really liked that we had this first off post-apocalyptic like post nuclear war kind of setting in the present day which this book does continuously flash back to and I also liked the idea of this being futuristic and also the sci-fi element where the fae were created by having their DNA spliced it's like human DNA spliced with animal created the fae race so that humanity could exist after this post-apocalyptic present day that the main character Clark is actually from. I loved all of that and I think that the plot in here was interesting but the romance for me the way that like the character it was like a werewolf romance it read like a kind of basic bare bones werewolf like paranormal romance which you guys all know that I just really don't like to read and in terms of paranormal creatures I think wolves are my least favorite they do come off very very creepy I only really realized this when I was reading Zodiac Academy and you all know I hate Seth because he is and he's the extreme okay I've never met a wolf was creepy as him but in general 
and since I've noticed that, I've noticed that all wolves give me the ick a little bit. So it wasn't really doing it for me in that regard. I will say though that it was a fast read. It was easy to get through. I was having a decent time. And then in the end, it contained one of my least favorite romance tropes ever which just completely killed the vibe for me and I had to take it down to a two star. So I am going to give the second book in this series a try because with series like this you do find that the first book tends to be the weakest. I will say that it's not looking overly hopeful that I'm going to enjoy this. It's like a very fast paced fun series. You all know that isn't my thing. It also follows a different couple every book. In most instances that also isn't my thing and I just don't really want to read paranormal romance because I'm having no success with it and I just don't think it's worth me continuing to pursue a genre where the chance of success is very low you know where I'm going to dislike 80% of the books it's not worth it for me to read that 80% for the 20% that I might enjoy you know thank you so much to Ash for gifting this one for me a whole ton of people in my patreon love this but sadly this one it, it might have been it would have been all right if it wasn't for that last trope but it still wouldn't have been good you know I then read Children of the Whales volume 11 by Abby Umida which is a manga series that I've been reading for quite some time now and honestly with this installment I, I am thinking about DNF in this series I'm directly at the halfway point and I think leading on from the point about paranormal romance I just don't like long series I feel like while journey is more important like a million times more important than destination I feel like I need to have a clear destination in sight for me to be able to enjoy and really get into a series and that was one of the reasons when I first started reading and trying out paranormal romance it was the length of the series and the episodic nature of them that was putting me off to start off with but this one is a manga series it's rated older teen so I class it as like YA but it's following this boy called Chikoro who is the archivist on the mud whale which is an island that floats along on the sea of sand they're a very isolated community they don't know that anybody else exists they know nothing of the wider world until they're floating past another island and they go to scout it for supplies and they find a girl who like throws their world right open and tells them about this world that they have no knowledge of. This causes them to have to confront a lot of harsh truths and also because of the the timeline I guess that they're on it puts a lot of conflict in their path that they then have to deal with. So I it was the art style that drew me to this series and I still absolutely love the art style. I feel like plot wise we do meander quite a lot. There are highs there are lows which is what is making me lose interest in this if you have filler episodes in a series then I just feel like the series just truly really does not need to be that long I believe that volume 22 is going to be the last installment in this series and because I've invested it's not a great deal of time to read a manga but because I'm like 11 volumes deep into this I feel like I've invested enough time to see it through but also I'm only halfway do I have it in me to go through another 11 volumes of a series that I'm very lukewarm about I like the element of not found family necessarily but I guess community family in this series. I like the concept. I like that there's so much more complexity than I thought there was going to be going into this with the the world building especially. I just feel like my reading experience has been disjointed and my will to continue because every time we have an installment that's a filler it kind of kills my drive to continue and then I don't really pick up the next volume and when I do I don't remember all of the characters but I don't want to reread anything. So I feel like I may cut my losses with this one but I do own volume 12 so I'll definitely be reading volume 12 and I guess we'll see how I feel after that one and then the final book that I read I'm surprised that I finished this in April I was almost certain that I was going to be dragging it through to the beginning of May but we ended on a high with my final book which was Before They Are Hanged by Joe Abercrombie so this one is the second book in the first law series which is an adult grimdark fantasy series it's a series that Catch Up Book Club are doing for 2023 into 2024 we're reading all of the Abercrombie books that are in the first law universe and this is oh my god what is this I still cannot concisely explain what this series is because of how many like moving parts we have the entire first book is 500 pages of setup introducing you to the characters the politics the world like the history before we kind of get started and it's only at the end of this book that I kind of knew what the end goal of the plot is going to be but while it's not the most spoileriest thing I could tell you it's still more than I would be comfortable disclosing in a non-spoiler review of a book like what the actual plot of this series is going to be because of how long it takes to get there essentially but in this series we are predominantly following three main characters one of which is a barbarian from the north one is a fencing champion who is a member of the nobility and one used to be a fencing champion a member of the nobility but he was captured and tortured by the southern empire which left him with a disability so when he came home 
he was given the job of Inquisitor, which is essentially like a torturer for the government. So I assumed that the series going in was going to be like a band of unlikely heroes come together to do whatever it is that the task at hand is. It's very much not that. These are three very separate people, even though two of them were in the same location, their paths don't really cross. And at the end of the first book, everybody was setting out to accomplish something like the equilibrium had shifted and the plot was going to start moving so I struggled through the first 80 pages of this book because it felt very much like we were starting the series again because everybody was in a different location than they were to start off with so even though they were the same characters even though we knew how we got there their circumstances had changed um I think they're all in different countries than the country that we were in predominantly in the first book so we had to learn about like I guess the new cultures and the new group dynamics that were at play but when I sank into it I truly truly sank into it and one of my favorite things about this series is is the humor. Do you know Crombie's writing has a lot of sarcasm which is my preferred form of humor. They say that sarcasm is the lowest form of wit and my response to that is always at least it's a form of wit because not everybody has that you know so I love me some sarcasm and I, I love that the because humor is very risky for me. I'm a very serious person and it's very easy for me to just not like humor at all depending on what type it is so I'm just really happy that I do like Joe Abercrombie's sense of humor. I also really like the characters and I liked some of the relationships that were beginning to develop through here especially the ones that I want to see Logan was building. I really enjoyed some of the character development especially on the part of Jazal. Um, I have some theories about some of the plot lines and like plot reveals that we're gonna have that still haven't come into fruition actually. Some of which I called in book one so I'm really intrigued to get into book three now and see if they are actually going to be major plot points but we do have multiple kind of plot lines running in here that are relevant to but are not actually like the end goal of the plot. So a lot of this series is is about war and something that's established very early on in the first book is that the North are trying to go to war with the Union. We also have some tension brewing in the South which does like bubble up to become like more of the story and we also have like established very early on in the first book is that magic is dying out. This is a world where people don't believe that magic ever existed apart from a select few that have seen it which is actually it's one of my favorite fantasy worlds it's very like game of thrones realm of the Eldlings, which is some of my favorite fantasy series so magic coming to the forefront and exploring the magic and the history of the magic and legendary figures is also a, ve a very very big part of this series and all of it kind of comes together into the end goal of this plot which definitely wasn't what i expected but also kind of makes sense and falls in line once again with series like game of thrones and realm of the Eldlings and things that i I really love this is inspired by um game of thrones not inherently but you can tell if you are familiar with game of thrones whether it's the show or the books you can tell if you read this that joe abercrombie has been influenced by george rr R. martin and i also personally love easter egg hunting when it comes to books and like seeing what authors have been influenced by so that was really cool. I also really like the way that Joe Abercrombie writes war in here. It's a very like I feel realistic matter of fact viewpoint where it doesn't make out that our characters are heroes that are saving the day by slaughtering people. It portrays the victims of this war, the, the soldiers on the front line I would say as real people like not as an enemy like a faceless enemy to be slain but like as a person that is being brutally murdered for the sake because the people who are on the floor in a war are not the people who are responsible for it they're just people that have been told to go to war you know um, and I feel like there's a very realistic like stark representation of that in this book. I gave this five stars I will say it was teetering between a four and a five and that is because I don't have that buzzy oh my god this is my new favorite book feeling about this but I feel like this has a very complex well laid out plot which you guys know I love to sink my teeth into and I cannot fault Joe Abercrombie's writing style at all. I love like I said I love the humor we're seeing some really good character development which you guys know I love so I do feel like it's very well done and it's detailed and complex but I just don't have that oh my god I would die for these characters and this book yet but I feel like as we're coming to the conclusion of this arc in the third book I feel like we could get there if we have some of our characters placed into some sticky 
situations where we don't really know what the outcome is. So those are the eight books that I read in the month of April. Absolutely not my best reading month but I guess the good thing about having a not great reading month is that it can only go up from here. I mean I would hate to think that it could go down from here because like damn we would be scraping the barrel but based on what I know I'm going to be picking up next like what my priority reads of May are going to be like two of my first three planned reads for May are five star predictions and I know that didn't go so well for me when it came to this stack of books but we can only hope all right I feel like if I rate those two books anything less than four stars um we will know that the problem is truly with me but yeah I'm just I'm hoping for more in May I don't anticipate having a lot of time to read in May which I talked about in my TBR if you want to check it out but anything I do manage to read to be fair in May is just going to be a bit of a bonus so down in the comments let me know how your April went most importantly let me know what your favorite read of April was and also if you participated in either Magical Readathon or Realmathon let me know how that turned out for you guys but aside from that please wish me luck for me keep your fingers crossed for me also don't forget to like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you wanna if you head to my description box you'll find a link to my goodreads instagram and twitter if you'd like to follow me on any of those as well as a link to my bookish candle website the etsy for that and a 10 percent off discount code that's it from me today guys bye oh you bite your friend like chocolate you say you're a go where nobody knows with guns in under our petticoats. We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no.